you could be here tonight. My name is Andrew Johnson. I'm the vice president here for Astronomy and Collections. And welcome to our Full Dome Kavli Lecture. We're especially grateful that you're here because we're well aware there's a certain baseball game going on right now. We will try to give you a score update later. But, uh, but here in the Full Dome, the Kavli Full Dome Lecture, it is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to be hearing from our speaker, but the dome will be filled with amazing visualizations to illustrate some of the scientific concepts that we'll be talking about tonight. And these visualizations were made by our team right here uh, in the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Uh, but we're not, just doing the, we're not just doing the program here in the Adler Planetarium. We're also reaching beyond the walls of this building. As you're listening to my voice right now, there's sites all over the world that are also listening in at the same time. And they're going to be seeing the same visualizations on their planetarium domes as you see here. In addition to that, there are people listening in and watching in using small virtual reality headsets. So we're actually distributing this kind of content all over the world in real time. And we'll, when we have a Q&A session after this talk, we'll be receiving questions here and also from questions uh, from the, some of those sites. The, we'd like to thank the Kavli Foundation for providing the resources that, to make all of this possible. We've got a great partnership with the Kavli Foundation. They've been our collaborators for uh, years now, being able to provide these kinds of lectures and also our new, uh, our new show called uh, Planet Nine that hopefully a lot of you have seen. Who has seen Planet Nine? Put your hand. Oh, wow. Here in Chicago, it's m almost half the audience. Uh, fantastic. Um, so we, we'd like to express our gratitude to the Kavli Foundation for making it possible for bringing you these cutting-edge visualizations and for reaching not just uh, audiences here in Chicago, but, but all, uh, all around the world. Um, so uh, we're, we're going we're to be learning a new way of looking around the universe from our speaker tonight, Dr. Nergis. Uh, are you ready to I'm go? I'm ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm wired. I, I, everyone can hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, Nergis is a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's also a MacArthur Fellow. Um, and uh, she has, for many years, uh, been working on exploring the universe using gravitational waves or trying to s seek them out in the universe. So please join me in welcoming her. We're, we're going to be learning about the warped universe, the 100-year journey of trying to detect gravitational waves. Ner Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Welcome to the planetarium, to your planetarium, wherever you are. Um, so I want to take you today on a journey into the warped and violent part of the universe. So this is, you know, you hold on to your seats because it could get a little rough. Um, and so everything we've learned about the universe, most things, I should say, we've learned about the universe, we have learned by observing light. And in fact, Humans have, since the beginning of time, peered into the sky and looked at the stars with our naked eyes. And what we've seen has both wowed us, awed us, and puzzled us. So in the early days of, of observation of the sky, we used our naked eyes. We plotted out where all the stars were. And in fact, if we look at the constellation Cassiopeia, the, the famous W in the sky, if you zoom in on that constellation with a, with a very good telescope, you wouldn't just see what our naked eyes can, can, can show us, but you would see a spectacular object in, uh, in, in that direction. And this object is a supernova remnant. So this is an object called Cassiopeia A, one of the most beautiful uh, uh, images, in, in, in part because it shows us the beauty of what nature can do, and in part because it shows us the power of what, of what human curiosity can do. So this is an image that's actually uh, uh, constructed from wavelengths of light that our eyes can see, uh, as well as wavelengths of light that the human eye cannot see. So this image is, is, is a composite where the green and yellow colors are, are imaged with the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is visible light that our own eyes could see. The red 
uh, 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 colors at the edges are, uh, and some in the center, are actually infrared light that our eyes could not see, but, uh, and that those were taken with the uh, Spitzer uh, Space Telescope. And then finally, the blue and purple colors at the very edges are, are um, uh, images uh, taken with X-ray uh, light, which is the Chandra X-ray Observatory, also in space. Now, when we put all of these different colors together, we can reconstruct the history of this object. About 300 years ago, this was a star, just like our very own sun, a, a, an ordinary star burning its nuclear fuel. But as m all stars do, this star ran out of nuclear fuel. So the energy crisis exists elsewhere in the universe as well. And when it ran out of, out of nuclear fuel, the, the star no longer has, has photons streaming out to hold it up, it up against its own gravity. And the gra its gravity crushes the star, and that causes a, uh, an explosion. And that explosion we know as a supernova. And so this was a star that, 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 that died and uh, went supernova, as we call it. Now, there's another object in this, in this image that's very important and, and, and pretty, and that's the little dot in the very center. It's quite a special uh, object. It's one that can o was only seen using the X-ray light. So if you looked at this with visible light or infrared light, that little spot would not show up. We would not know there's, there's an object there. This object is called a neutron star. It is the new star that's born when an ordinary star like our sun dies. It's also quite a peculiar object. This neutron star has a, the mass ab uh, about the mass of our sun. So it's about the same mass as our sun, but its radius is about 10 kilometers. So this is an object that's the size of a small little town, but with the mass of our sun. Now let's just put this in perspective. Our own sun has a radius of 700,000 kilometers. So this is an object that has a lot of mass in a very small volume. And this is going to be an important player for us going into the story. Now, if the object, the, the original star that, that lost, you know, that, that went supernova, that, that burnt out its, its fuel, had been a few times heavier than our sun, so three or times more massive than our sun or more, what would have formed in the center would not be a neutron star. It would be a black hole. So the black hole is, is shown over here. And this is an artist's uh, uh, depiction of what a black hole would look like. I, it's, an, uh, it's a star that has so much gravity that it even light cannot escape. So when, when, when the ordinary star collapses and it keeps getting smaller and smaller, it becomes a black hole when you scrunch all of its mass into a small enough volume that light cannot escape. Now, this happens to be an artist's rendition because on in general, we cannot see black holes. They are black. Here, uh, what we've learned about black holes comes from the few black holes we know of that live in, in, in gas and dust. And what they do is, as these black holes spin about their own axes, they heat up the gas and dust, and the gas and dust around them glows. And by measuring that gas and dust, we can tell that there's a black hole there. Now, these black holes also have these spectacular plumes that come out of their, uh, out of their poles. And those are also characteristic of black holes. They're one way that people like to think about them is that black holes are very sloppy eaters. So as they uh, gobble up material around their equator or their bellies, some of it spews out from the poles. But that, that's what we know about black holes, mostly by looking at gas and dust around them or looking at orbits of other stars that are near black holes. How might we directly observe uh, a black hole? Well, light isn't going to do, do it for us because of them being un light unfriendly. Gravity is the answer. So we know that black holes have a lot of mass, and therefore we should be able to use that property of black holes to observe them. And there, to, to think about how to do that, we have to understand gravity. Now, our first understanding of gravity came from Sir Isaac Newton in the 17th century. And Newton had a very successful theory of gravitation, where he could explain with his, with his, 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 uh, his theory why planets orbited the sun, why moons orbited the planet, even why apples fell to the ground. And this was actually, you know, we experience gravity every single day. We jump up and we land on our feet, most of us do. And we say that's gravity, but this was pretty revolutionary because Newton put 
mathematics into it and showed that you could actually make predictions about where, where uh, planets would be. Now, Newton really struggled with, with, with one piece of this himself, and this was the idea of action at a distance. The question he asked was, how, do the, how does the planet know about the moon, and how does the moon know about the planet? How do they influence each other when they're not touching? And that conundrum was solved by our next hero of gravity, who was Einstein. Einstein told us to forget about gravity being a force. He said gravity is geometry. And this was part of his general theory of relativity that he uh, formulated in the years 1915, 16, 18. And so in his picture of, of, of gravity, all of space-time, you can think of a, a grid being laid down on it. And whenever there's a massive object in some region of space, it warps or deforms that region of space-time, and the grid uh, deforms. And in fact, if you have a star, it makes a little cup. And if you have a more compact, massive object like a black hole, it makes a, 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 a funnel. And if you have a really uh, a heavy black hole, it makes a very pointy funnel. We've all seen those pictures. Now, out of Einstein's theory came another question, which, which, he, which he posed, which was, what happens if the star isn't just sitting around in, in empty space? What if the star is moving? What if it's accelerating? What if it's oscillating? What if it's colliding? And in that case, he found something rather startling in his own, in his own equations, which was that as a star oscillates, the space-time around the star begins to uh, 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 wave a uh, ripple, just as if you would drop uh, a rock on the surface of a smooth pond, and then the ripples from, from where you drop the ro rock would spread out over the pond. That was Einstein's picture of what would happen with, uh, with the, uh, the space-time itself. An oscillating object would cause ripples in the fabric of space-time itself. And this is what, this is a pretty, pretty um, uh, in this particular case, it's a, it's a rather artistic rendition of these ripples. And you can see what happens. They're rather, they're, they're strongest right near the object. And then as they spread out, just as with light waves, just as a light bulb becomes dimmer when you, when you, when you move farther away, these also, uh, uh, get the waves get um, uh, smaller and smaller as they propagate out from the source. Now, an ob the kinds of objects that we might be able, might con contemplate being able to measure here on the Earth are slightly more complex. What, what we're looking at here are two neutron stars or black holes. We now know that neutron stars and black holes are cousins. And so if neutron stars or, or, or black holes are orbiting each other, what happens is because of the extremely strong gravitational uh, field around them, they don't follow orbits the way uh, New Newton's theory would, would, uh, would require. But in fact, they follow Einstein's predictions. And all of the space-time around them ripples. And those ripples uh, spread out uh, and uh, away from the source. Now, even though Einstein made this prediction, he himself remained quite ambivalent about gravitational waves. So he actually wrote down the complete theory of general relativity in 1915 and 16. He actually made a mistake in the 1916 paper, which he corrected in, the, in a 1918 paper. But in the original 1916 paper on gravitational waves, he actually dismissed them as having no practical purpose whatsoever. And he remained pretty ambivalent for, for many decades after. And indeed, in 1936, he actually wrote a paper uh, with another physicist, Rosen, with the title of the paper was, Do Gravitational Waves Exist? Question mark. No. Period. <laughs> and he submitted this paper to the premier physics uh, uh, journal, uh, uh, Physical Review. And right around this time, in the, in the mid-1930s, the Physical Review and many other academic journals actually had just begun the process of peer review. So the new editor of Physical Review, John Tate, sends Einstein's paper out for review, and it gets rejected. The reviewer uh, writes back saying, there's a mistake in this. This is not correct. So uh, Einstein gets this rejection, and he is very unhappy. So this correspondence, which you can't really read uh, uh, particularly well, especially the, the part that's in German, what it uh, what, it's, what it says essentially is, uh, he, he writes to the editor saying, I sent you a paper for publication, not for review. So the 
uh, editor writes back and says, I'm sorry, this is our new process, but you should maybe pay some attention to the review. You know, there's, you know, um, so Einstein's uh, actually uh, never published again in physical review, and that paper actually got published in a, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat obscure journal called the Journal of the Franklin Institute. Now, a year, uh, within the same year, the person who reviewed the paper was another pretty uh, um, prominent physicist of the time by the name of Robertson. And, and Robertson uh, somehow got the message across through an, an, a mutual physicist to Einstein of what the mistake in the paper was. And, uh, and uh, Einstein said, oh, I knew that. Okay, So that's the last word we have from Einstein on gravitational waves. But the controversy actually raged um, in the physics community for m uh, decades after and really didn't start to subside till the 19 late 1950s and early 1960s. But the real uh, sort of coup for gravitational waves came in 1974 when two s uh, uh, s scientists by the name of Hulse and Taylor discovered a pair of neutron stars that were in orbit around each other. Now, how would they know that? Well, it turned out that one of those neutron stars was a pulsar. A pulsar is a neutron star, but it's spinning rapidly around its axis, and as a result, it has very strong magnetic fields. And so the light from a pulsar becomes beamed like a lighthouse beam. So, you know, our own sun, it's radiating light in all directions. Any side you look at it, you, you, you'll see light. Pulsars are like lighthouses. They're spinning, and the light beam just crosses our line of sight twice per revolution. So they used this. So this, is the, this was discovered using the, the uh, Arecibo radio telescope, which is actually the, the dish of the telescope is a, is a, uh, a, is a crater in, uh, in Puerto Rico. And using this radio telescope, they were able to, to count the light pulses from the pulsar crossing their line of sight and time them. And by using that timing, they could tell that the two neutron stars, one of which was a pulsar, was get, were getting closer to each other. Now, do we expect that? Emphatically, yes. If they are relativistic enough that they are radiating gravitational waves, and those gravitational waves carry away energy, in, uh, then that energy makes the stars get closer to each other. And that's indeed what they measured. So their data is, is, th is uh, measured uh, between 1974, when the objects were first discovered, and, and 2005. And in fact, there have been measurements since then. And so the, 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 the dots are their data points. And the solid line is the exact prediction from Einstein's theory of general relativity of how those stars are getting closer to each other. So what's shown here is the distance between the two stars. And you can see that the distance is getting uh, less and less over time as they're radiating away gravitational waves. And that was the, the prediction. So this is widely celebrated as the first sort of observational evidence that gravitational waves really do exist. Einstein's 1936 paper was clearly not correct. And the, uh, uh, for, for this discovery, Hulse and Taylor got the Nobel Prize in 1993. So this, is wa this was sort of the state of, of affairs in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The first neutron stars had been discovered in 1967. The first pair of neutron stars had been discovered. This m discovery of Hulse and Taylor had happened. And around that time, Kip Thorne, who was a professor at Caltech, a new professor at Caltech at the time, had started to calculate what would be, what would the signal from these gravitational waves look like? What would be, how, what would the signal look like? How strong would it be? How might we go about uh, uh, sort of understanding the, the gravitational wave signal? And to his horror, he found that the signals were really, really small. So these early calculations for of what would happen if pairs of neutron stars or black holes orbited each other and collided gave, gave the, the number that by the time such gravitational waves from such an object reached the Earth, they would have an amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. Now that's a very, very small number. It's actually a decimal point with 20 zeros after it and then a 1. So this was clearly you know, a, a fairly daunting um, uh, undertaking. But Thorne had started to think about how one might do that. Now, fast forward to the early 21st century. 
And we've now gotten to the place where we are able to actually solve Einstein's equations using uh, supercomputers. And here is a simulation of two black holes that are orbiting each other and will eventually collide. And just below the movie, you can see the signal accumulating as the two black holes go around each other. And what the, what's shown on the surface there is that is the, the curvature shows the curvature of space-time. The colors show the flow of, of, of time itself. And you can see that the space-time around the black holes is very warped. At this moment, we actually slow the movie down so you can see what happens when the two black holes actually touch each other, their horizons touch, and you can see the spectacular warpage of space-time. This is somewhere you do not want to be. Okay. <laughs> Now, the, the two black holes collide, and they form a, a single uh, black hole, which uh, goes quiescent. And the gravitational waves from this event sort of propagate out into the universe. And that is, an, that is actually an, 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 an exact computer simulation of something that in the early days was, was pretty hard to, to calculate at the time that Thorne and others were starting to do this. Now, around the exact same time, so we're still in the late 1960s and 70s, People also uh, started to ask if it might be possible to detect gravitational waves. That actually b started in I before the, the late 1960s and 70s, but right around this time, people were really interested in that question. But to answer the question of whether one could detect gravitational waves, one has to ask, what do they do here on the Earth? And what they do is, as they pass through any region of space, they shrink and stretch the space-time. So here is a ring of particles. And as they, they, they pass through the, this ring of particles, they stretch and shrink the, the, the ring. And you can see uh, that they, uh, they propagate in this stretching, shrinking way through the universe. So even right now, we ourselves are being bathed by gravitational waves that are stretching and shrinking us, but ever so slightly. Seeing this pattern of stretching and shrinking gave the idea for how one might measure them. And that's where our tool of measurement enters, which is the laser interferometer. So this is Ray Weiss. And Ray, Ray Weiss was a professor at MIT at the time. This was, again, in, in, the, in, the, in the 60s. And he started to think about how one might measure these and came up with the idea that the way to do it would be to use an interferometer. And so the way a laser interferometer works is really well suited for this for measuring stretching and shrinking of space because we get a light wave that, that leaves the, the laser and it arrives at a special mirror that we call a beam splitter, which basically takes the light wave and makes half of it reflect and lets the other half of it transmit through the mirror. Those two light waves then hit uh, mirrors at the, at the ends, get reflected, and they return back to the beam splitter. And then if the at the output, we can measure the interference. Now, what does the interference mean? It simply is this process of if the peaks line up with the peaks, then we get a lot of light out at the output detector. If the peaks line up with the troughs, the waves cancel and we get no light. And that process it depends on where the mirrors are relative to each other. So if you set up the measurement to have no light, and then a gravitational wave passes through this instrument, and changes the distance that the light beams had to travel because it changes the distance between the mirrors, then you would get uh, some light out. And that's how the measurement is made. And this idea was, was, was actually had been thought of independently by Weiss and, 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 and by, uh, by others. But wha what Weiss did was he then carried this to some very important further realizations that made it possible to actually implement. So this is an overhead view of, the, uh, of an observatory, of a gravitational wave observatory. In this particular case, it's, it's LIGO. That's the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and, uh, and, uh, which, which are the US detectors. Now, what you see here are a big central building. And then going out at right angles are two arms. And, and those arms go for four kilometers. So that's two and a half miles in, in each, each direction. And that was Weiss's first realization, that if it's to be possible to measure this really, really weak effect, you have to make the detectors long. Now, why? Well, it turns out that the amount by which the space shrinks, or the amount by which the, the mirrors move, 
is proportional to the amplitude of the gravitational wave, and it is also proportional to the distance between the laser and the mirrors. So the, more, the longer you make that distance, the, the easier the measurement gets. And so in the case of, of these four kilometer long detectors from, uh, of, of LIGO, the measurement we have to make I is to measure motions of the mirrors at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. Small number. Um, let's try to put that into perspective a little bit. So a proton, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the nucleus of an atom, a single proton, has a diameter of 10 to the minus 15 meters. So this measurement is a thousand times smaller than that. Now, if you don't like protons, they're a little too small for you, we can talk about an atom. Then a hydrogen atom, at that's, uh, that's about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So this measurement is a hundred million times sm uh, uh, smaller than, than a single atom. So it's a very, very precise measurement. And that's why we need this big observatory and a big instrument, not just the length, which gives us, sets the scale for how much the mirrors will move when the gravitational wave goes through, but also all of the equipment that you need to keep the mirrors very, very still. So if everything on our planet wants to move these mirrors by more than 10 to the minus 18 meters, and usually by factors of millions more than that. So there's a lot of vibration isolation that's, that's in involved in, in making these instruments. And once you succeed in making the mirrors very, very still, you still have one other thing to do. You need to be able to have a way of measuring these tiny motions that are due to the gravitational wave. Now, you couldn't just use a ruler. You couldn't use a vernier caliper. These are all the ways that you might think of of making a, pre a precision distance measurement. Those are all not good enough. What you need is you need light. And what we use is the wavelength of light itself is our, our ruler. And so it turns out that laser light, even though it's, it's really some of the best light that humans know how to make, very, 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 very pristine, very precise, it still isn't precise enough. And it isn't precise enough because laser light is quantized. We know that light occurs as, as photons. And one of the rules of quantum physics is that we cannot measure quantities uh, with infinite precision at, at all times. And so in the case of LIGO, we are limited by the quantum jittering uh, of the light. Um, and it's a little bit like if you were trying to measure a piece of paper with a ruler and the tick marks on your rulers keep jittering or sloshing around on you. You wouldn't make a very good measurement. And that's what the laser light does for us. And so in our labs at, at MIT, we actually work on, uh, on experiments that allow us to make this laser light jitter a li little bit less. So what we do is we take the, o the laser light and we, we take the laser light and we um, push it, send it through a particular uh, optical system that makes those quantum fluctuations a little bit less. So here is a typical optical bench where, where uh, I'm working with one of my colleagues on, on uh, making these, uh, these specially engineered quantum states of light. And when we, it's a, you'll, you'll see as we zoom in, it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, uh, complex optical setup. And when we pass our light through this, this process of quantum engineering, we eventually get it to be quieter than uh, it started off. So we actually can make a special quantum state of light that allows us to make the measurement with, uh, with a better ruler, if you will. So here we have laser light, if it were only that good. But really, it starts off usually like that. And then at the end of our experiments, we can reduce the jitter. And that gives us a better measurement. So that now tells us the complete story of, of the observatories. These were built in the, 19, in the 1990s. In the US, they were funded by the National uh, Science Foundation, Foundation. And in September 2015, the two LIGO detectors in Washington State and Louisiana were on the air when they recorded two signals. Each observatory recorded a signal, and the signals were seven milliseconds apart, because that's the 
the, the like travel time or the gravitational wave travel time between Louisiana and, and Washington. And the signals in both detectors looked uh, pretty much like each other. And they also look pretty much like what we would expect from the collision of two black holes as Einstein had shown us. Now, there's a number of things that are elegant about this measurement. And, and so the first thing to notice is that the amplitude of the gravitational wave, which we call strain because it's a change in length per length. Remember, it's the thing that makes space-time distortions. So the amplitude at the very maximum was around 10 to the minus 21. So that's a pretty spectacular check mark for, for Thorne and, and colleagues who were calculating these in, in numbers in the 1960s that indeed we were able to, uh, that, that's sort of what the wave did do. The time scale is interesting. This is it, the time scale is, is, is uh, under a second. It's about uh, 0.2 seconds. So we are l seeing the last you know, fraction of a second of these pair of black holes that have been orbiting for millions, if not billions of years, and then they collide, and we got, got the last few second, uh, fractions of a second of their lives. Now, the third thing that's kind of really remarkable about this, uh, this, uh, this data is that instead of, of, of strain, if you turned it into motion of the mirrors, this corresponds to uh, 4 times 10 to the minus 18 meters, which is, which is to say that this is the detectors work at that precision. And this was, the, this was the work, so, you know, again, started off by Thorne and Weiss, but then carried out over the last many decades by really literally hundreds of s scientists. And this was um, stunning enough in terms of, of, uh, of uh, uh, a discovery. What we can do now is we can ask the question, what can this signal tell us? So right now it just looks like a bunch of bumps and wiggles. But really it turns out remarkably, given how ambivalent Einstein was about gravitational waves, the math that he wrote, wrote down gives us an enormous amount of information encoded in gravitational waves about the source. So the very first, so this is, this is a, a model of the same event that I showed data for a moment ago. And what we see here is that the, the, the frequency of the signal is changing. And what we can tell is that at early times, the two black holes were farther apart and were orbiting each other more slowly. And then as they get closer and closer to each other because the, of, of gravitational radiation, they orbit faster. And by looking at that change in frequency, how fast were they orbiting far away and how fast they're orbiting closer in, we can tell what the masses of the black holes were. Now, similarly, if you look at the amplitude, you look at the size of the, the, the peaks, that's also changing. When they're far apart, the, the amplitude of the wave is smaller. And then as they get closer and closer together, the amplitude grows. And it actually gets to a maximum just when the two black holes touch. And so from that, the, the, that amplitude, we can tell how far the black holes were. And then finally, the two black holes uh, that have collided, they kind of just merge into one single black hole that wobbles for a little bit and then sort of quiets down. And by looking at that last bit of signal where, where the wobble uh, uh, quiets down, we can actually tell the mass of the final black hole. And when we put all of that information together, we we've uncovered a rather incredible system. The two original black holes were about 30 times the mass of our sun, so pretty heavy and a little bit of a surprise. We weren't expecting black holes to be uh, heavy in that, ma that heavy in that mass range. The, at the time that they actually collided, when, when, when they touched, they were whipping around each other at half the speed of light. So we have to take a pause here, right? This is, these are objects that are 30 times the mass of our sun whipping around at half the speed of light. Uh, again, I'll remind people, you really didn't want to be nearby. And it turns out, happily, we weren't nearby. It turns out that these, uh, the, these two, uh, this event happened 1.3 billion light years away. So it's pretty far out into the universe. Now, there's another really interesting thing that we, s we found. Remember, we could tell the mass of the final black hole. Well, it turns out that the mass of the final black hole was less than the mass of the, of the two original black holes by about three solar masses. And so in this fraction of a second, three times the mass of our sun 
was radiated away as gravitational wave energy. So it's a, it was again a very, very uh, powerful collision, if you will. For this brief instant, uh, if, if it was more powerful than all the shining uh, stars in the universe. Uh, so that was what we could, could tell about this object. And this, of course, has caused a lot of excitement, in part because of the discovery of black holes, in part uh, that, that, ha that you know, we've never before, we've known about black holes. We have never before seen two black holes colliding with each other and see that process unfold in real time. We have never before seen space-time ripples directly. We have never before been able to look at this object, which would, if we had pointed a telescope at this with that uses light, we would probably see nothing. So this is a completely new way to look at the uh, at l to look at the universe, and that caused a lot of excitement. And in fact, the founding fathers of the uh, of of the field uh, went to uh, to Oslo to receive the prestigious uh, Kavli Prize. So there, are the two gentlemen um, in in the center, Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne, are uh, receiving the Kavli Prize for this discovery, and uh, and sharing it with the the you know in spirit with the over thousand scientists that worked on the project now is it over are we done we've made the detection we've gotten the prizes should we pack up and go home and the answer is emphatically no this is actually really just the beginning and in fact a whole global network of gravitational wave observatories is coming up the two in the united states are are the are the two LIGO detectors in Hanford, Washington, and Livingston, Louisiana? There are two de uh, detectors in in uh, Europe. There is the three kilometers. So LIGO is four kilometers long. There's a three kilometer long uh, detector in Italy called Virgo. There's a, s a small 600 meter long detector in Germany called Geo, and there's a planned observatory in 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 India called LIGO India, and then Kagra is a three kilometer long detector uh, in that's uh, under construction in Japan, and. This network of detectors, the Virgo detector, should be on the air to observe with LIGO sometime next year. Kagra is, is, is a couple of years behind, and then LIGO India a few years behind that. Now, this whole global network of detectors is also augmented by a space detector that's planned, and that is called LISA, which stands for the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And LISA is a a uh, constellation of three spacecraft that are, are a million kilometers uh, uh, apart from each other. And each spacecraft shoots a laser beam at, uh, at its two neighboring spacecraft. And by measuring the light travel time of those laser beams between spacecraft, we can tell if a gravitational wave uh, pass, uh, passes through this constellation. And LISA is, is very complementary to the, the Earth-based detectors because LISA measures gravitational waves that are much, much slower. So LIGO and Virgo and these terrestrial gravitational wave detectors actually make measurements of objects that are whipping around each other at a 100 times per second, whereas LISA looks at the more at slower objects like supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies that are actually move, you know, orbiting each other sort of at the rate of you know, once uh, per many hours or days or even longer. So that is sort of where all the ob observations are taking us. Now I want to take this moment. Uh, so is that er everything? Uh, so far, and the answer is no. So you s I've already talked about the first event that LIGO observed, and that was on in, in September 2015. Now, in October 2015, we observed a second collision of, of black holes. Those black holes were, were quite a bit farther away, so it was a much weaker signal. And as a result, we can't tell very well where on the sky it is. That's what these bands show. These bands show that this is the our best guess at where on the sky these uh, these black hole collisions uh, were located. So that was in October, and then in December, on December 26th, we detected a third black hole collision, and that's the 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 the, the red arc here. Now, as these as more and more observatories come on the air in the in the global network. Uh, not only will we be, be able to see more objects and farther out as the sensitivities improve, but having more of these observatories will allow us to better uh, localize where these objects are in the sky. And so that's sort of the, the next 
big thing that will co that will come out of these observations is to be able to tell more accurately where they are as well as getting more of them. And that's where we are today in, in 2016. Now I want to reflect for just a, a brief moment on what this means for us in sort of taking the long historical view. So this is, uh, is the images that Galileo drew in his notebook in 1609 uh, of the phase of, of the moon, he, uh, he was the first person we know of that pointed a telescope into the sky. And it was a pretty modest telescope. It was a small one and a half inch diameter uh, piece of glass. And he observed the craters of the moon. He noticed that Venus had, had phases. These are, uh, you know, modest observations by, by today's standards where we can do those things with, with just with, with bi uh, binoculars. But much more important than his discoveries was the paradigm shift that occurred, which was the first time that we realized we don't have to just use our naked eyes to observe the universe. We could start to use telescopes. And in the, in the centuries that intervened, we've made, humans have made better and better telescopes. And this, in fact, uh, is the 100-inch uh, the telescope at Mount Wilson in California. This was the telescope that at the turn of the, uh, of the you know, in, in the uh, or, you know, in the 1920s was used to make the measurements of galaxies that told us our universe is expanding. So as we've gotten uh, better and better at making instruments, we've been able to construct more and more information about our, our universe. And indeed, that sort of brings us full circle to not only have we used optical telescopes, but we've also added other colors of light that our own eyes couldn't see. In, in this case, we're back to uh, this beautiful image of Cassiopeia A, where we are able to see it both with infrared and X-ray in addition to the wavelengths we've seen. And that is where we are with gravitational wave observa observations. We've only just pointed our very first telescope into the sky. We've seen the very first couple of things that we possibly could. And as the decades and centuries go ahead, we will be able to map out the universe with gravitational waves out to the very edge of the universe, we, we hope of the ob ob observable universe. And what that promises to do for us is this is the first time that we can think about measuring those parts of the universe that may be inherently dark. No light comes off of there, but there is enough gravity and warpage of space-time that this is the these are the instruments to use. So thank you for listening, and I hope you had some fun. Thanks very much. We do have uh, time uh, for questions. Uh, if, you're in, if you're listening in from one of our remote sites, I encourage you to submit those questions. We'll get them right off here, and, and we'll get them answered. Uh, before we did that, I wanted to actually mention some of the remote venues that are joining us tonight. I have a list here. Uh, listening in right now are folks from Vancouver, BC. Oh, yes. I, I w that's great. Hi, Mom and Dad. <laughs> <laughs> And if mom and dad, you could, <laughs> if you submit a question, you'll get to the head of the line. Right? Uh, uh, but also in, in Moscow, uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, so we, we've got both the Twin Cities covered, it looks like. Um, uh, elsewhere in Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota, Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, we've got most of Minnesota covered, I suppose. Fort Collins, Colorado. Cas no, Casper, Wyoming was, was earlier today. Oh, Moorhead, Minnesota. And then finally, University of Alaska, Anchorage. So thanks all for, for joining us out there. Um, we're going to have a discussion with you, but I also wanted to mention to everybody a way in which everybody can participate in this. You can be part of this voyage of discovery. I'd like to tell you about Gravity Spy. Now, for those of you here in Chicago, saw some of this as you were uh, coming in, I believe. But people were showing it on, on tablet computers. Gravity Spy is a new citizen science project that we've just started here at the Adler. We at the Adler were one of the world leaders in, in citizen science, which enables people to participate in actual research. Uh, remember the squiggles and bumps in data that were mentioned earlier. Sometimes that's an example of one of those on the screen right now. Um, sometimes computer programs can identify those squiggles and bumps, but other times humans uh, need, need to get involved. So this is an opportunity for you to actually log on uh, on the internet there at gravityspy.org. And, and participate in, uh, in some of these uh, activities yourself. I got to ask uh, the folks in the back, do we have an update on the uh, baseball game? 
zero zero yes we do it's a bit of a pitcher's duel zero zero middle of the fourth excellent okay well done well i I, i'm gonna go ahead and get the ball rolling for a question because it it, we often we want to know about the the science and and the research that goes on but it's also interesting to learn about the journeys that scientists have how they get interested in in these kinds of activities and what inspired them and i know when you and i were speaking earlier today you had you had a funny story about uh, how your journey got going in the direction of looking at uh, gravitational waves, if you could share some of that. Yeah, so funny, I don't know, but it, it's, uh, uh, I certainly just fumbled onto it. It wasn't part of some, some master plan. Uh, so I was a graduate student in the early 1990s at MIT, at, at, at where Ray Weiss was, and he had been working on, on these gravitation wave detectors, and I was just looking for an interesting project to work on. So I went to see, to see Ray, and uh, it was the strangest interview. So he asked me, what do you know? I was thought about a strange question. I, what what part of my knowledge should I s- answer this with? Uh, so ha- you know, being a n- you know new minted graduate student, I was like, okay, I've been taking all these fantastic physics classes. So I started to tell him about all the advanced physics classes I was doing. He stopped me dead in my tracks. He's like, I, I don't care about that. What do you know how to do? I was like, oh, okay. And so then it clicked for me that this actually speaks to what a fantastic experimentalist he is. He really understands the importance of being able to do to build experiments. So I told him I knew how to build electronics. I knew how to use a machine shop. And then he didn't want to know anymore. He was like, yeah, you're okay. You can come work for me. (laughs) So that's how I started. And then after that interaction, the next thing in the same conversation was he told me about LIGO and gravitational waves. And he told me about the precision of the measurement. And I kind of, I thought he was absolutely nuts. <laughs> and I, you know, I kept asking him, is that the number? Is that really what you said? And he actually kind of got a little annoyed. And he wrote it down like, yeah, that's the number. <laughs> and uh, so then you know, I started working on this. And I have to say, within weeks, I was completely hooked. I mean, really addicted, because it was such an elegant measurement. And you know, sometimes we m- do measurements because they're elegant. But here, it was an elegant measurement that also could open up something so enormous for us. So, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years and, you know, I'm, you know, I have to say I'm glad we finally measured a gravitational wave. So, <laughs> so. All right. <laughs> it was, it was described uh, earlier this evening that the last time the Cubs won a World Series was before Einstein was predicting these things. So it's, uh, Yes. <laughs> I think we have a question from one of our uh, remote venues. Yeah, we've got a couple things. Uh, one, Nergis, your parents say hello back. <laughs> so you know. And uh, from uh, friends in St. Paul, Minnesota, they want to know if we can use gravitational wave detection to see inside of a black hole. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And the answer is, as far as we know, unfortunately not. There, We can't actually look inside uh, black holes with any means that we know of in our in our present universe. We can map out the, 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 the black hole all the way to its horizon, but after that it's you know game over. So another remote question or should we t- take one locally? Yeah. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Let's um, yeah so we we got um, actually I'm gonna combine two into one here. Uh, one this question is coming from Duluth in Vancouver. They want to know when Lisa is planned for launch and they're wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how it works besides just shooting lasers at itself. Right. Yeah, so uh, LISA is, uh, it's the present launch date is somewhere between 2030 and 2034. So it's a, it's a little ways off. And the principle of the measurement is actually that on each spacecraft there's a laser and, besi- and along with the laser there's also a very good uh, a reference source uh, which, so laser beams are shot from one spacecraft to the next and the, the spacecraft that's receiving the laser beam takes the received laser beam and compares it to a local reference, if you will, like a local clock. And that is how you can tell how long it took the light beam to travel from one spacecraft to the other. It does that pairwise between all the spacecraft and then reconstructs the actual warpage of space-time by by combinations of those pairs. Maybe we'll take a question here in Chicago. Anyway, a few. Right there, sir. Go ahead. If you could use that, yeah. Hi, I'm wondering, uh, with these detectors, are they aimed in any way, or is it just sitting there waiting for stuff to fly by? Yeah, that's a really good question. So they are, they're not very directional. They're a little bit kind of like our ears. You know, our eyes are very, very 
pointy, right? They, you, you can look at things and know exactly where, where you're looking. Your ears, when you hear a sound, it's either coming from there or there, but not really well resolved. They're kind of like that. So the L-shaped detectors I have a sensitivity that's maximum uh, right above and right below, but they have sensitivity in a, in a sort of lobes that go on either side. And so, and then the way that you actually point them, if you will, is through the rotation of the Earth. And that's how they point in different directions. And that's part of why you, when we tell you where the source was, we show you these big arcs on the sky. Because any, any uh, pair of detectors can only resolve that to sort of an, an, a, 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 a ring on the sky. And that's part of why it's so important to get these other observatories going. Because then what you do is you overlap a ring pairwise this way and a ring pairwise that way and you get a, a, a more centralized region. And so that's part of the motivation for getting all these observatories going. Another question here in, in Chicago. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, right, right there, here. I was just wondering, will quantum mechanics allow a, a greater or a increasing resolution for gravitational waves so they could perhaps be used for looking further back in the universe? Yeah, so let me say a little bit um, uh, more about that. So th the experiments that I showed you uh, that we do in, in my lab, what do we really do there? So really, so what quantum physics tells us is that you can't measure quantities with infinite precision. So let's take a simple example. Let's take a particle, any particle you like. And w if we know where the particle is, if we know its position very, very well, we can't know its momentum very well, which means we can't tell how fast it's going. If I know where you are, I can't tell where, you, where you're going to be going next, is the way to think about this. So the way that qu what quantum mechanics does is then for every particle of this kind, it sort of shrouds it in, 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 a, in fuzziness, in a fuzzball of not knowing exactly where the particle is or not knowing where it'll go next. Now, light is similar. Light is photons. Fo there it's, it, it, it's quantized. And so in the case of, of light, what we do is we do a very similar thing to the, the case of the particles. So think of it as, as, as uh, having a fuzz ball. Okay, So we have this ball of fuzz. And what we do in our labs is, so you, what you'd like to do is, so what's the fuzz ball doing? It's making uh, everything look like it jitters. What we'd like to do is just shrink the fuzz ball. But that is unphysical. That's precisely what quantum mechanics does not allow. What it does allow is instead of taking the fuzzball and just making it smaller, it allows you to take the fuzzball and squeeze it so that you can make one direction, you can make it into an, 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 an ellipsoid, if you will, and then one direction is smaller than the other direction. And as long as you use that quantity that got s the where the fuzz got smaller to make the measurement, then you do better. So in the case of light, we can think of it as simply you think of a wave. A wave has two properties. It has an amplitude and it has a phase, which is where are the zero crossings. And so what we do is since we care about the zero crossings, we're measuring the phase, we actually reduce the uncertainty in the phase whilst letting the uncertainty in the amplitude get much bigger. And, then, and that's something we can do in our lab. So that's how we actually make it work. And when you do that, you can actually make improvements in the sensitivities of the of gravitational wave detectors at the level of about factor of two or so, which is which you know we fight hard for. So maybe a Chicago yeah. question on this side. Here's <laughs> one here. Excellent. Yes, go ahead. I wanted to ask, <laughs> why do you need two LIGOs? Ishi, that's a great question. <laughs> Um, okay, so we need two LIGOs because for a few reasons. The one is that when you're looking at signals that are very, very small and there's a lot of other stuff that can confuse you or make noise, you want to be able to make a measurement in, in more than one detector to be sure that you aren't just measuring something that was local to that detector. So uh, for example, if you had only one detector and that detector you know, and a, a truck drove by on a bump, you might measure something that looks like a gravitational wave. Um, if you had a second detector far away, that truck could not bump that second detector as well. And so that's one reason you do that. Uh, that's called doing a, a coincidence measurement. The second reason you do that is the reason we talked about where if you want to know where in the sky the source is, you'd like to have more than one detector so you can start to, to localize it. So that's another reason to do it. I think we've got a remote question. We've got quite a few. Uh, let's see here. Where to begin? Uh, all right. So let's start with our friends in Anchorage. 
What do we know about what's inside a black hole? What do we know about what's inside a, a black hole? We don't know very much at all. We know mathematically what's inside is a, something called a singularity. And what that simply means is that the space-time is, you know, is warped to the point where you've, you've seen these famous funnel diagrams, and essentially we don't exactly know. It becomes ill-defined where the, the, uh, the funnel ends. Um, in, you know, I, you know, people sometimes uh, say black holes are, you know, I don't know if Einstein said this or someone else invented this, this saying, that black holes are, are, are the place where God di divided by zero. <laughs> okay. But um, uh, but you've heard that said, um, and so we know mathematically what space-time looks like, or, or, uh, you know, in the region of the black hole. But once you're inside the black hole, we we actually don't know. Go ahead, another. Right. One. Yeah, let's jump up to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. So they're curious: when the singularities of black holes merge, which would be two points of infinite gravity mm -hmm. yet zero mass. Wouldn't it be fundamentally impossible for one of those singularities to simply disappear? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I have no idea <laughs> how to, you know, how to answer that. So I don't know. <laughs> how about something a little easier from Fort Collins? <laughs> uh, they're curious. What do you think should be the next big project after Lisa? After Lisa, okay, so that brings me to um, something that I didn't talk about, but I, I would love to say something about, which is what else could we ima hope to, to see using gravitational waves? So we've seen collisions of black holes, and the other thing that I think this generation of instruments that are coming up now will see, will see collisions of neutron stars, which are inherently different and interesting because neutron stars actually are made of matter, and when you see collisions of matter of that sort, you'll learn new things about that. But then what else might you see? And one of the things that, 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 that uh, you know, physicists and uh, scientists really dream about is being able to look back at the very, very early universe. So, you know, at the, you know, at, at, at the very instant of the Big Bang and, and shortly after that. Now, it turns out that we have observed uh, the early universe using light, and that we call the cosmic microwave background. But the light that we see from the from the co uh, that co constitutes the cosmic microwave background it, it comes to us when the universe was 400,000 years old. Now, at times before that, we can't see the light because the light, the universe was hot and dense, and the light didn't escape. Now, let me just give you a way to think about this. So, light or photons are essentially like going to a party with an extrovert. So, you say to this person, "I'm ready to go home." And they'll be like, okay, and then by the time you actually get out of the party, it's an hour because they stopped and talked to everybody. And photons are like that. Every time they meet matter, they scatter, they, they, they disperse. And so they actually just got trapped in the, in, the, in, the, in the hot soup of the early universe. And that's why that's so. So now if you wanted to look farther back in time, closer to the earliest moments of the Big Bang, Gravitational waves are, are a good tool because gravitational waves are exactly the opposite. They are the introvert at the party. You say you're ready to go, and you're lucky if they find the host and say thank you, and they're out the door, right? And so, so that's uh, so. When you think about what are the ne you know what's the really the next sort of instruments to build. For me personally, and I think many scientists would dream of this, would be to build instruments that can actually observe gravitational waves from the very, very early universe. And uh, this generation of instruments can't do that by factors of thousands to million. So these are, you know, these are, there have to be very big advances to do that. And there are other ways to make that measurement as well. So these are complementary ways. So, you know, if LISA launches in 2034, I am afraid to say how old I'll be. I was going to say not my problem <laughs> by then. <laughs> but, uh, but so, yeah, but I think that the idea is, look, the other thing is it's unpredictable what technological paradigm shifts could happen in the meantime. What stops us from making better detectors now may not be the same things that are obstacles, you know, 20 years from now. So I, I, I would be very optimistic. And maybe another Chicago question. You have a question? Yeah. This is a little bit related to the singularity, but when the two black holes collide, mm -hmm. 
and since we can't see what's in them, do we sort of have an idea of what happens to that mysterious information? Does it get combined? So what we what, what we do know is that we form a new black hole, right? And that black hole has a, a, a horizon around it. And so whatever uh, you know, whatever w it shrouds that new black hole was what was the contents of the original black hole. So I don't think we have s uh, some terrible information sort of um, uh, you know conundrum there because there is another uh, a new horizon. We haven't certainly ripped it apart, and there's no more horizon, which would then be you know the the place where we'd get into trouble with information suddenly being able to spew out at us that couldn't before. So there's been a question in the front here. Andrew, so for a while. Yes, please go so ahead. Yeah. Um, I, Do you want to buy? I was wondering why uh, why we look so far into outer space to look for gravitational waves mm -hmm. and not at the Earth, or if we might be able to detect them here. Yeah. So, so the question is a really good one because you know, why don't we? Why do we have to look at these objects so far out in the universe? Why don't we just use the Earth or objects uh, in the solar system? It turns out that you really, really need these objects that are, are compact, lots of mass in a small volume, just to have enough space-time distortion. And that's part of the reason why, for example, Newton's theory was so successful in the solar system, because we just don't have strong enough gravity around here. And that's also the reason why Einstein's ambivalence about this was so justified. Look, in, the, in his lifetime, he died in 1955, and you know, neutron stars and black holes weren't dis discovered until the, the uh, 1967 to 1970. So he didn't know about such objects really being there. They had been proposed, and there was theories about them. So, so I think that's, uh, so the answer is really this, there's nothing in our solar system that's compact enough to give us strong enough you know, gravitationally warping spacetime. Great. Well, I. That's the time we have this evening. I'd really like to thank Nurgis <laughs> Mavavala for in taking us on this incredible journey. <laughs> thank you. Incredible. Thank I also just want to thank my friends in, in, in the back who did all these beautiful visuals. Yes, so Mark please. and Patrick. So, uh, yeah. So. so. So, and thanks to all our remote uh, visitors for, for, uh, for having us tonight. Uh, if you're here in Chicago, uh, please join us out in our welcome gallery here. Thanks very much for coming. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. <laughs>